And we are back. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You forced me to talk this way, and I do it against my better judgment. But now that we're at it, I may as well bring up the matter of visions and revelations that God gave me. For instance, I know a man who 14 years ago was seized by Christ and swept in ecstasy to the heights of heaven. I really don't know if this book, if this took place in the body or out of it. Only God knows. I also know that this man was hijacked into paradise again. Whether in or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. There he heard the unspeakable spoken, but was forbidden to tell what he heard. This is the man I want to talk about, but about myself, I'm not saying another word apart from the humiliations. If I had a mind to brag a little, I could probably do it without looking ridiculous, and I'd still be speaking plain truth all the way. But I'll spare you. I don't want anyone imagining me as anything other than the fool you'd encounter if you saw me on the street or heard me talk. Because of, because of the extravagance of those revelations, and so I wouldn't get a big head, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angels, Satan's angel did his best to get me down. Satan's angel did his best to get me down. What he in fact did was push me to my knees, no danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift. I begged God to remove it. Three times I did that, and then he told me, my grace is enough, it's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on, my, on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. Now, I take limitations in stride and with good cheer, these limitations that cut me down to size, abuse, accidents, oppositions, bad breaks, I just let Christ take over, and so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. Verse 11 to 13. Well, now I've done it. I've made a complete fool of myself by going on like this. But it's not all my fault. You put me up to it. You should have been doing this for me, sticking up for me, and commending me instead of making me do it for myself. You know from personal experience that even if I'm a nobody, a nothing, I wasn't second rate compared to those big shot apostles you're so taken with. All the signs that mark a true apostle were in evidence while I was with you through good times and bad, signs of portent, signs of wonder, signs of power. Did you get less of me or of God than any of the other churches? The only thing you got less of was less responsibility for my upkeep. Well, I'm sorry. Forgive me for depriving you. Verse 14 and 15. Everything is in readiness now for this. My third visit to you, but don't worry about it. You won't have to put yourselves out. I'll be no more a bother to you this time than on the other visits. I have no interest in what you have, only in you. Children shouldn't have to look out for their parents. Parents look out for their children. I'd be most happy to empty my pockets, even mortgage my life for your good. So how does it happen that the more I love you, the less I'm loved? And why is it that I keep coming across these whiffs of gossip about how my self-support was a front behind which I worked an elaborate scam? Where's the evidence? Did I cheat or trick you through anyone I sent? I asked Titus to visit and send some brothers along. Did they swindle you out of anything? And haven't we always been just as above, above board, just as honest? I hope you don't think that all along we've been making our defense before you, the jury. You're not the jury. God is the jury. God revealed in Christ, and we make our case before him. And we've gone to all the trouble of supporting ourselves so that we won't be in the way or get in the way of your growing up. I do, verses 20 to 21. 
I do admit that I have fears that when I come, you'll disappoint me and I'll disappoint you. And in frustration with each other, everything will fall to pieces. Quarrels, jealousy, flaring tempers, taking sides, angry words, vicious rumors, swelled heads, and general bedlam. I don't look forward to a second humiliation by God among you, compounded by hot tears over that crowd that keeps sinning over and over in the same old ways, who refuse to turn away from their pigsty of evil, sexual disorder, and indecency in which they wallow. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 to 4. Well, this is my third visit coming up. Remember the scripture that says, a matter becomes clear after two or three witnesses give evidence. On my second visit, I warned that bunch that keeps sinning over and over in the same old ways, that when I came back, I wouldn't go easy on them. Now, preparing for the third, I'm saying it again from a distance. If you haven't changed your ways by the time I get there, look out. You who have been demanding proof that Christ speaks through me will get more than you bargained for. You'll get the full force of Christ. Don't think you won't. He was, sheer, he was sheer weakness and humiliation when he was killed on the cross. But oh, he's alive now. In the mighty power of God, we weren't much to look at either when we were humiliated among you. But when we deal with you this next time, we'll be alive in Christ, strengthened by God. Verses 8 to 9. Test yourselves to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along, taking everything for granted. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need first-hand evidence, not mere heresy, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. I hope the test won't show that we have failed. But if it comes to that, we'd rather the test show our failure than yours. We're rooting for the truth to win out in love. We couldn't possibly do otherwise. We don't just put up with our limitations, we celebrate them, and then go on to celebrate every strength, every triumph of the truth in you. We pray hard that it will all come together in your lives. Verse 10, I'm writing this to you now so that when I come, I won't have to say another word on the subject. The authority the master gave me is for putting people together, not taking them apart. I want to get on with it and not have to spend time on reprimands. Verse 11 to 13, and that's about it, friends. Be cheerful. Keep things in good repair. Keep your spirits up. Think in harmony. Be agreeable. Do all that, and the God of love and peace will be with you for sure. Greet one another with a holy embrace. All the brothers and sisters here say hello. Verse 14, the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Amen.